Before I read the scripture this morning from Isaiah 55, I'd like to welcome Pastor Timothy and his family. And when he comes up here to, to give us the message, I'm going to ask him to introduce his family at that time and any friends that he may have brought with us. The scripture this morning is from Isaiah, verse 6 to 11, from chapter 55. Isaiah 55, 6 to 11. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Pastor Timothy. Welcome. Thank you very much uh, for that word. Uh, before I speak this morning, I just want to, I want to ask my family to stand up. And also we have two friends here who are with us. Uh, uh, we are very grateful to God for this opportunity. And that's my wife, Anne, and uh, that is be, uh, beside her is Joanna. Uh, Seth just graduated from high school, and together with Martha, they are here to go to Camp Plus. Uh, very thankful so much for the support that uh, they have had from this community. Then we have our two friends from Columbus. Uh, uh, that is uh, Mary and McKenna. McKenna actually means somebody who is happy. And I told her she looks just like her name. And Mary is also uh, a, a registered nurse with a, a nursing agency there. And I told her she needs to come and be with us here and meet you. They are wonderful people. And so it's so nice to have I know they don't want me to keep them standing, so I'll ask them to sit. <laughs> it's kind of uh, sensitive. But I'm, I'm grateful to be here today, and uh, I, I bring uh, a lot of nice memories. Uh, those of you who probably came uh, later, maybe you may not believe it, it's actually seven years uh, this November from when we came to America. So life goes very fast. And uh, when we came, Joanna was two years old, I remember one time we were driving through Berlin, Ohio, and, uh, and Joanna said she wanted to use the bathroom, and we were in the middle of nowhere in Amish country. So when she insisted so much, and it was snowing and cold, we stopped the car and then told her, well, have no choice. Rather than doing it in the car, just run through the woods there. Then she got out, came back immediately, said, I'm okay. So... <laughs> Until we got to the home we were going to. So we have very nice memories of, of this place, but uh, we are really grateful to be here. And before I bring the word also, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we did meet Pastor Doug uh, recently. He and uh, uh, several of you came for the graduation of our son uh, in Cincinnati. And it is always a pleasure, especially when we drive up here, just to see also the distance you cover to come to us. We really are grateful. Uh, as a family, we are so indebted and grateful to you, and also our church in Kenya. Uh, I, I was in Kenya recently, as you know, I do some uh, mission work in the drilling ministry, and I was very happy. I actually did go to see the building project that uh, Oak Grove community has been involved in, the Bible school, which is coming up very well. So there are many reasons to thank this community. We are really proud to be associated with you and very grateful. Uh, my host, uh, Dennis and uh, uh, Karen, they, they've been wonderful. Uh, the only thing I blame Dennis is because his potatoes have caused me a little problem here, but uh, <laughs> we will forgive him for that. He has some very nice potatoes. When you eat potatoes, this is what happens. Uh, <laughs> but last night, uh, Karen gave us some blueberries, and we had them this. I understand they improve your thinking, 
So uh, I'm not sure they have kicked in yet, but uh, if you see a change in my thinking patterns, uh, Dennis and I have been eating blueberries a lot, and uh, we are hoping it will keep up raising our uh, understanding of things. But anyway, I want to just go straight to the word. I like to uh, give attention to that because it's an important part of my life. And uh, I talked to Doug the other day. I told him, Doug, you're not going to be in church when I preach. So he said, make sure you fix everything before I come. So I was just teasing him about it. But Doug and I are good friends. We have had a good time. And we love your pastor. He's been wonderful, uh, very encouraging. Together with Miriam, we have a lot of respect for them. They love the Lord and they love missions. And even our people in Kenya really appreciate your pastor. So thank you so much for allowing him to take us a vertical leave. That is not very common today in many places. I just want us actually to extend the, the, the little lesson here we had with the children, the invitation. And I'm actually going to talk about the invitation. Uh, my message is simply about the fact that we, the great invitation. And uh, in the book of Isaiah uh, is a very good reminder uh, of what God promises us. Isaiah is divided into two portions. Isaiah 1 to 39 is a series of judgments and people are being judged for this. They are being called to repent on this. But then from chapter 40 all the way to chapter 66 is a, is a book of hope. There is hope, restoration. And one of the things we see in Isaiah uh, is this great invitation. And today I want to believe that uh, in the next few minutes, by the grace of God, I want us to feel invited to Jesus. I know this comes maybe across when people think about those people out there who don't know the Lord and those people out in the mission field who need somebody to go and tell them. But amazingly, in the Bible we see a constant reminder of people being called back to God. And, and honestly speaking, every time in, in my life myself, I feel I need that. Because if you are like me, I would say like the singer who said, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. So take my heart and, and seal it for the courts above. So this, this portion that our sister has read for us uh, is a good reminder about the invitation. And Isaiah was a very unique gentleman. Isaiah was not just a prophet. He actually had some connection with the royal family. That's why you see in Isaiah 38 and in other places, he had a very easy access to the palace. He was a prophet who actually talked about Jesus more than any other prophet in the Old Testament uh, uh, pr writing prophets. All the writings of Jesus in the Old Testament put together, Isaiah gets a big chunk of them. He's the one who talked about the virgin shall conceive. He's the one who talked about Jesus as the wonderful counselor. There's a lot that Isaiah talks about Jesus. And there is so much depth we can learn from this book. It's uh, probably one of those books in the Bible that uh, if you take time to study the book of Isaiah, it's just transforming at a time when things were difficult. And so the word that we have been reminded today, and I want to echo them again, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Uh, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And it continues there. And so today as we, as we look into this, I want to remind you today about the many reminders in the Bible that actually call us to come back to the Lord. I was looking at that briefly in my ears as I was getting ready about this, that God in his wisdom always is calling us to come. If you read in the beginning of that chapter, it actually begins to say, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk. Uh, uh, without money and without price. So it's a story of welcome. And the word come abounds in the Lord calling his own. And so we are being told to come to the waters. If you read earlier in the beginning of Isaiah, it is the same place we find Isaiah uh, telling the people, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. You know, the Lord wants people to come, let us reason together. And there is that appeal every time of us being told to come. And I saw my, my, and I'm going to bring a few uh, aspects to this angle. 
Because when you look later in the New Testament, Jesus is also in constant invitation. Even people following him, he would take a moment and tell them, come, because I believe maybe they were together with him, but probably they were not connected properly, and he would always call, come. Uh, when you see the calling of the first disciples, uh, the first thing that we see Jesus when he met the disciples in, in the book of John, he, he tells them, come and see. They wanted to know where he was staying, and he tells them, come and see. And then when Philip finds Nathaniel, uh, the inquisitive Nathaniel wonders whether anything good can come from Nazareth, and the word again is there, come and see. We see all that, and Jesus teaching in another place. He's talking to these people, and he tells them, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Allow me to come that the invitation, or to say that the invitation, come, is still there today. It's a very simple word, come. You know, it's, it's just as simple as it can get. I don't even think you need a dictionary to, def to define that word, come. It's something we have been told either by your mom or your teacher or somebody else, come. It's, it's just so simple, but yet it is so profound. When you think about come, it's not just a physical walking towards somebody. It's actually even in a mental way, uh, looking towards that direction and going in a new place. So I want you to see this great invitation. And today, by the grace of God, I hope that I'm going to invite you to come. I'm going to invite myself to come close to Jesus. You know, look at Mary and Martha. Martha goes uh, when they are there, and one of them sits down at the feet of Jesus, and the other one is busy. Because even when Jesus is there, we can be obsessed with many things, and that's why he keeps reminding us, come. And my message today, even if you may forget other things, don't forget about this word, come. Don't forget the fact that every day in your life, as you get up in the morning, that's what God is telling you, come. I ran away from him for many years of my life as a young man, and yet every time the Lord was telling me, come. And I want to be honest with you, even, even now as a minister, there are times I feel like I, I can easily deviate from my purpose and my calling, and every time God is telling me, come. The, the Bible actually, as we're going to, to see shortly here, it's not about a religion, by the way. I always remind people, Christianity is not just a religion. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with a savior. We, we are called to, to, to him all the time. And today, as you are seated here in this house, are you feeling that connection or you feel like you need to take another step that is telling you, come? I want to highlight a couple things here as, uh, on that portion my our service leader read for us. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. For us to come to the Lord, I want to highlight a couple of things very quickly. We need to understand divine opportunities. I like that statement that says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I want to emphasize those two phrases. While he may be found and while he is near. Why was Isaiah saying that? Are there times the Lord cannot be found? Are there times the Lord is not as near? And here the Isaiah is reminding us something important. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I want to remind all of us here. Divine opportunities are moments when God manifests himself in very clear ways. And when those moments come... It is very important for you to really be aware about the importance of tapping the opportunity when it comes. There are many times in life we actually miss things that we could do because we miss those opportunities. And those opportunities are rare sometimes. Uh, when Jesus was about to, just, just if you allow me to, we be in the same thought here. When you read the book of Luke, the book of Luke is what we call a travel narrative. From Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus is, can I have the microphone there, please, beside you, Joanna? Uh, because so that I can also travel as I talk about Luke. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Am I okay here? Thank you. Whatever happened to Eric? Hey. Hello? Oh, the bottom? Oh, okay. 
Oh, hold on a second. Well, we don't have this in Cincinnati, you can be certain. Hello? Well, I'll skip it. Oh, am I there? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the book of, the book of uh, Luke is a, is a travel narrative. And, I, and I'm just saying, understand the divine opportunities. Seek the Lord while he may be found. While he is near, it's good to recognize that. And in Luke, the Bible tells us as Jesus is traveling from Luke 9.51... It says he set his mind to go towards Jerusalem. And I want you to see Jesus looking at the city. I don't know whether you have seen. There are some cities that have such a good view. I, I haven't been to Israel. It's one of my goals. We had a nice conversation with Dennis and Karen last night as they were telling us the stories of how they had a nice trip to Israel. And uh, I hear Jerusalem is a city on a hill. And it reminds me of a city in my country. We have a city called Machakos. There is a way you can appear to that city. It is a city with five hills. And there is a way you can appear and just look down and see the whole city. And uh, that is how they used to build the city on those days. But when Jesus is coming towards Jerusalem, you know when you come to a city, you can get excited. I've always been, I love traveling, so sometimes when I go to places, I see a city, I always feel good about seeing a new place. Recently, when I was going back to Africa for a drilling mission, for the first time, I flew through Paris, France, and I, you know, I've flown through other cities, but it was so nice just to see the skyline of that city coming in, and you get excited by that momentous view of a beautiful city. But when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, he did not really get excited. Actually, Jesus was sad. You know why he was sad? He said in Luke 19, 41 to 42, now as he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it. When he saw the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it. And the Bible says, uh, he say, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. In another place, there is a place where Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. When Jesus saw Jerusalem, he had pity on the city. Because Jerusalem missed the divine opportunity of the coming of the Messiah. And when he went there, he cried over it. And I said to myself, do I miss divine opportunities? Am I there when the Lord is doing something in my life and I miss it? What is God doing in your life right now? Are you seizing those opportunities in your life? That is why I say today it's a great invitation. I know you're a believer, but I want to ask you, are you like Jerusalem? When Jesus went and saw Jerusalem, he was not captivated by the city. He felt sorrowful. He felt sad. He saw it and he wept. And this is one of the other place other than John 13, 36, when Jesus wept. Jesus wept when his friend died. The other thing that made Jesus weep is this occurrence of the city of Jerusalem missing the divine opportunity. Today I want to encourage you to, as, as we think about the opportunities that abound. There was a time in uh, the days of Jesus Christ and this is something I've never, I'll never understand until we go to heaven. But you know there are people who actually met Jesus personally and their lives were not changed. There are people who are even in the meetings where Jesus was speaking and their lives were not changed. They missed the opportunity. Just because you are in a party doesn't mean you're going to go home full. Because you have to, to kind of get into whatever is going on, eat or whatever is being provided. And one place I see this happening, I want to be careful here about time, but don't worry. Doug is not in. I can stretch my time a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be careful. I, I got a limit of when I'm to stop. But it, this is what the Bible says in, in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, just listen to this divine opportunity. There was a time that Jesus was teaching. And in Luke chapter 5 verse 17, it happened on a certain day as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come from every town of Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord 
was present to heal them. Can you imagine? Jesus is teaching and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, it was like a big conference. People came from Jerusalem, I mean, I mean from Galilee, they came from Judea, they came from all over the place and the Bible says the power of the Lord was present to heal. And you know what? Maybe there were people there who needed healing. But look at this. This is something that I find amazing. Then behold, some men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed and they sought to bring him and lay him on, uh, lay before him. When they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went to the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. I want you to see this thing. These are actually people... <laughs> You know, divine opportunities are very interesting. These guys who got a blessing there, they were not invited. They were gate crushers. <laughs> you know, gate crushers are people who, who, who come and they are not invited to the party. But they ended up becoming the recipients of the blessing. Because they, 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 the Pharisees were there, the Sadducees were there, the teachers of the law were there. They were all seated down. And the, and the teaching of Jesus was going on. And look. I want you to understand Luke is a doctor. Luke gives us more detail than the other gospel writer from a very scholarly perspective. When, Peter, when, when, when Matthew says that Peter's mother-in-law was sick, Luke will tell us Peter's mother-in-law was sick with fever. He gets more specific, which is good for doctors. But here Luke tells us, other than the teaching that was going on, the power of healing was present. This was an opportunity for people to receive healing. And yet these guys were just seated there and doing nothing. And these people out of the blues, they come and the place was packed. And when they had no opportunity, you know what they did? They went through the ceiling. They were ready to pay the cost. They went through the ceiling and opened it up. My encouragement to you is that you don't miss the divine opportunity. Whenever God provides an opportunity for you, don't miss it. Don't come to this place and live empty-handed. The Lord would like to bless you today and renew your life. You are here today and you're going through a difficult moment in your life. Church is not like a golf club. You just go and play golf with your friend and then go home. Oh boy, that was a good day, man. We never had a win. The balls were going smoothly. That, this is a different story from a golf club. You are here in the presence of the Lord. And these people were seated listening to Jesus and none of them received. Actually, if you read the story later, I don't want to go further in that. When you read the story later, they even complained when this man was healed. When he was forgiven, they started doubting and grumbling. And Jesus, even to their contempt, he told them, if you are really just concerned because this man has been forgiven, he told him, now take up your pallet and walk. That guy went home well and happy. And the other people went home grouchy and sad. How do you leave such a place? How do you leave a place like this? You come to a meeting, and this is a guy who was not invited, but he went home with a blessing. Why? Because he saw the divine opportunity. Where I come from, when we preach, we tell our neighbors, are you seeing an opportunity? Can you tell your neighbor that? Do you see an opportunity? Yeah. <laughs> I know that is something that, but my encouragement to you, do you see an opportunity today? Is there something God would like to do in your life? The Lord is telling you, come, I'm here. I want to do something for you. I love that story. It's just a very good reminder. I may not go through, you know, one other thing, when you don't finish your sermon, it creates an opportunity to be invited again. So I may do two points. <laughs> And then the other one, we have to say, oh boy, Pastor Doug, Pastor Timothy has to come back. He left us halfway because time ran out. You know, you have to seize the divine opportunity, you know. If you go back to Isaiah 55, I'm still on that scripture. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The other thing I like, and I love that other invitation aspect in Isaiah, is that be willing to change or be ready to change. The Bible says, let the wicked uh, forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. 
you know, I love this invitation, but I always find it amazing that uh, every time Christ invited people, he stretched them a little further when they came to him. By the way, I'm a very strong believer that everybody is welcome to come to Jesus. Come as you are, anybody. Whether somebody is living in sin of all kinds of description, come. Somebody, whether you're an alcoholic or you're addicted to drugs or you are, you are obsessed with a sudden addiction you can't get away from, come, come, you're invited. But then when you come, be willing to change. That is always something I find in the scripture. Come as you are, but be willing to change. Because actually the Lord, in his wisdom, invites us to come as we are. I came in bad shape when I came to the Lord. <laughs> I was in really bad shape. But one good thing is that I met a minister who was helpful to me to guide me to just get off these habits that were in my life that I needed to be transformed in. And so I'm not here to condemn you, by the way. If you're struggling in any area of your life, come. But I'm here to remind you, the Bible says, let the wicked forsake his ways. Actually, if you read in the description of Bible language, the action here is required in the believer. You know, there are things in the Bible that God does for us, but there are some actions that we are told to do. It is actually not the Lord who is being told to forsake his way. It is a person who is wicked. Another version says, let me not use the word wicked. Another person, uh, version says, let the man of iniquity forsake his way. If somebody has been living in iniquity, when you come, the Bible says, come as you are, yes, but be willing to change. Then it says, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. And it continues, return, come to the Lord. Then it says, let him return and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for our God will greatly pardon. Come as you are, but let's be willing to change. A transformed mindset is when we get a new way of thinking. The Bible actually says we, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And by the way, that's a very, very deep passage in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Previously, it says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. The Living Bible actually says, do not be squeezed into the mold of this world. But be transformed. And that word transformation, listen carefully. The word transformation doesn't just mean a tilt. Actually, it means to be a totally new person altogether. Not in your power, but in power of what the Lord does for us. I was reading another definition of the word repentance. The word repentance in the Greek language is actually two words. The word metanoia is from two words in Greek. First word is meta, which means change. It is from where we get the scientific words like metamorphosis whereby even the, in science, like an insect changes from an egg to a lava, pupa, adult, all those stuff. And then, so that matter, and then the second word, which coin, coins together to form the one word in English called repentance, metanoia, the second word in noia is from the word nous, which is the Greek word for mind. So it means that a, repentance is actually a change of mindset. And my encouragement to you, I say this with love because I believe God is doing a new thing in each of us. That when I come to the Lord, I'm supposed to be transformed by getting a new mindset. And that's why the Bible is saying, let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous his thought and let him return to the Lord. The Lord will always welcome you home then. I love the prodigal son because the Bible says when he realized what he was doing, he came to his mind and he said, you know what? I'm going to get up and go back to my daddy. I'm not going to stay here. But I like that attitude. He was willing to change. Even the way he says, he was not going home on his own terms. He was going home on his father's terms. That's something we always forget. He said, I'm going to go to my daddy and tell him I'm coming here to be your servant because I've messed up. But you know, the loving father did more than the son did. My encouragement to you is, come as you are, but be willing to change. 
Allow the Lord to renew you. Allow the Lord to bring a new dimension in your life because there are so many opportunities that abound. And lastly, so that I, I, will, I will leave that one more point to make Linda call me back here. Let's enter into the, enter into the divine realm in your thought life. This is actually, this portion was even very challenging for me as I thought about it. When God tells them, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's just mind-boggling to me. And here I'm being invited. By the way, this is another invitation, even to a higher level. That the thoughts of God are not like my thoughts. And his ways are not like my ways. For us to continue walking with the Lord, we are being invited to enter into that realm whereby as we are transformed, we get a renewed way of thinking. Because when you start thinking the way the Lord does, that is a very higher level of spiritual maturity. When your mind is transformed to go to the level whereby I think the way the Lord thinks. You may have a problem today and you may have things or thoughts. Look at Naaman, the man who had leprosy. He was sick with leprosy. He's told about the God of Israel. And then when he goes to the God of Israel, he was told there's a prophet called Elisha. He goes to Elisha and Elisha tells him, hey, General Naaman, you go down to the Jordan River, dip yourself seven times. And you know, now man complains and says, I thought, I thought this is what he's going to do. Why is he? Doesn't he know I'm a general? Doesn't he know who I am? Doesn't he know my titles and all these badges? How can he tell me to do such a trivial thing? Doesn't he know I'm a part of the nobility? And I'm not supposed to do that kind of stuff. Don't we have rivers in our country of Syria where I can go and do this in a more, less indignifying way? He was still operating in his own thoughts and yet he wanted God to perform a miracle. My encouragement to you today is that God actually has a way out for your problem. God has a way out for the struggles you may be having. But I and you, I have to put myself in the ways of God. That's why God tells us, my thoughts, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. Just like the heaven is high above. That is how my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than my thoughts. Boy, I thought about this scripture and it was mind-boggling to me. And I said, God, please help me to understand your ways. There are times I've been helpless. I don't know what to do. But I've always found when I find the mind of God about something, I know that is the way to go. My encouragement to you, I don't know what you're facing today, but I would like you to submit yourself to the thoughts of the Lord. The Lord wants to do something for your life, but you know one of the greatest enemies? It is the way you think. It is the way I think. Because I may have a preconceived way of thinking and yet the Lord his solutions are always easier because they are supernatural the way the Lord works is different from the way we think and that's why Jesus had a big problem with the people of his days because he operated on a different level and they rejected him because his thoughts were on another level I'm not saying we may get to his level of thinking but I want to remind you today as I remind myself that Timothy learned the ways of the Lord. Learned to, actually the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ. And then in another place, as, as I finish, it says, we are going to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. When I think about that, man, that's a tough exercise. Because if you are like me, I think all the time. I have thoughts and ideas. And I conjure up things. I go into all kind of thinking. But you know what the Lord says? 
Timothy, your ways and my ways are different. It is not the Lord who is going to come down to my ways. It is me who is being invited to go high to the level that the Lord wants me to the ways he wants me to. And that scripture says we take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. When I was in uh, Dennis's house last night, one, one of the things, by the way, whenever we come here, we solve another problem. Uh, there's a time, I think the first time we came here, there's a person who had some roosters that were waking them up all the time and uh, Pastor Doug told them, Pastor Timothy is going to come and that problem will be solved forever. <laughs> Period. So we, we solved a problem like that yesterday, so don't worry. So if you have a rooster causing you trouble, just wait next time I'm coming. <laughs> Total solution. But anyway, this is what I wanted to say. I don't know whether Dennis, I notice you have a trap. I don't know whether it's for coyotes. And whenever, whenever something is trapped, look like a big trap, not like a rat trap, where they put it in the field with some corn, attract this coyote or whatever, they get in and they get trapped. And I was thinking about it. Do you know that's how our thoughts, we need to do with our thoughts? We need to take them captive and give them to Jesus. Just the way we trap those things that don't benefit us, whether it's rats or coyotes or whatever, there are some thoughts, by the way, that are not beneficial to you. There are some thoughts that are retrogressive. They keep you backward, keep me backward. There are some thoughts that are backward spiritually in the sense that you cannot see what the Lord wants you to see. My encouragement to you, I say this in love, I struggled a lot in this until I told Lord, help me to think the way you think. And I tell you, it is a process I'm still growing in. I invite you that we get into this journey. My thoughts are not your thoughts, Timothy, and my ways are not your ways. As you're looking at me right now, I want to tell you what. You may have a problem, but for God, that problem was solved 2,000 years ago. The only thing that is lacking is for your thoughts and my thoughts to think the way God thinks. Time did not allow me to go to the last portion of the scripture about the word. But my encouragement to you, let's put our thoughts and make them captive. And make them captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Again, you are invited. I am invited. And this invitation remains open. The cards are available. The only thing we need to do, me and you, is to come. You are invited. Let's be willing to seize the divine opportunity. Let's be willing to change where the Lord wants us to change. And let us be willing to be, to get the thought and the mindset that God has for us. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Loving Father, I first of all bring myself to you because you are inviting me again and again to come to you. And I want to willingly say, yes, Lord, I come. I want to extend this invitation to my brothers and my sisters. And I want to say to everyone of us here that you are telling us, come. Even though we are in whatever situation, you want us to come. Pray that today we will not miss the opportunity we have in our lives to be transformed by you and by the power of your word. And again, I thank you very much that you're putting a new thought system in us so that we may think the way you do, we may walk the way you walk. As we close our eyes in prayer, I know there are things that are ahead of us, but this moment I want to give you an opportunity. Are you telling the Lord, I need you in this situation? Pray that you intervene for my family, in my health, in my financial situations. I need you, Lord. Just lift up your hand where you are. I'm going to pray for you. The Lord bless you as you do that. Anyone who's saying, Pastor, pray with me. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? The Lord bless you. Father, as those hands are lifted, I pray that it will not be about me, 
it is about you, O oh Lord, as you take control of every thought and every part of our lives. And again, I thank you that you are inviting us to you, O oh God. Thank you again for this beautiful family of Oak Grove. Pray even for the meeting this afternoon as there is going to be a meeting or annual meeting or whatever business that is going to transpire there. May your power and blessing be upon your people. Thank you for the way this community has been a blessing to me and to the church in Africa. I pray that you bless them indeed. And again, thank you as we live today. Give us a new thought system. It's only you who can do that. And that's the reason we submit to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you very much. As far as I know, I'm five minutes short <laughs> of the time. I don't have a song to sing for you. If I took it a little longer, it's okay. I'm going to go to Cincinnati, so I'll be on the road for quite a while. And by the time I get home, you'll have forgotten about it anyway. Uh, but I want to thank you so much for the time. Uh, Anne and I, I think you know, I, I, you probably know that I do mission work. I resigned my full-time position as a hospice chaplain. I do that optional. And every so often, I'm involved in a ministry called Drilling for Life. This is a ministry based in Pennsylvania. Some three gentlemen, or actually five people, who put hands together and bought a water drilling system. And uh, I'm involved as an outreach uh, mission director for that ministry. So you can be praying for us about that. Uh, uh, when I'm not here, what my wife does, she runs a little store to uh, make sure that uh, they have food on the table before I come back. So she had a few items in the car. Uh, we'll be packed outside there as you have your meal. So if you want to see a few African items in that van, you're welcome. It's really been a great pleasure, and we love you. Yeah, you have no choice. We have to love you, so we love each other. God bless you. Thank you so much for having us.